What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. My review of The Mandalorian Season 1 finale. Let's all just take a collective sigh of relief. For all the bad that Disney has done with their episodic films, I think we have a great series. I think we, uh, we just finished up a great season. I'm enjoying it for the most part. So I think you got to give credit where credit's due. Now, just a reminder, this is a spoiler review, so we're going to talk about this episode like you've seen it. Okay, I got a list of the good and the bad, so let's get into it. All right, number one, and I'm going to say this about this episode, but really the entire season, is the visual effects have been impressive from the start. I mean, they're really good. When you say a Star Wars TV series, that's probably your number one concern. Well, it's probably number two. I mean, number one is going to be story, but number two is definitely the visual effects. Can they keep up? Can they fit seamlessly into the Star Wars universe? And I got to say, this show has done that. I think the opening scene with the speeder troopers had some funny moments. I like the fact that IG-11 came to the rescue. I really liked Mando's predator vision. I think this is the first time or maybe the second time we've actually looked through his visor and it really wasn't predator view. It wasn't like heat vision, but he was looking for a specific item and he was using the computer on his wrist to find that. And then once he found that, it highlighted that on his visor. It's like a Mandalorian Google Glass. I think Moff Gideon as a character is just, he's impressive. I think his, his dialogue is spot on. He's very intimidating. He's obviously very knowledgeable. He knows all their names and everything about them. We find out in this episode, Mando's name, it's Din Jarrell. Din Jarl, Din Jarl, I'm going to call him DJ. Moff Gideon mentions something about the Night of a Thousand Tears, and I like what this show is doing. They're hinting at what has happened with the Mandalorians, the slaughter, the uh, uh, the purge, you know, which is different from the Jedi purge. And I like how they haven't just spelled that out for us, exactly what happened. They're giving us little nuggets that we can just sort of piece together, and I hope that continues because it, it makes you invested in the show. The shootout scene was awesome, everything from IG-88 to, to Mando busting out and and picking up the big gun and just laying waste to everybody. I thought that was going to be a little bit like episode one, uh, but, but it turned out to be not the case. And of course, Moth Gideon comes out amongst all this craziness, and he's just, he's got one blaster, but he's surgical with his shots, and he's able to disarm Mando and make a difference on this chaotic battle scene. And that just goes to show you, this guy, this guy's good. This guy's really good. I like that we go back to the covert one more time and we get to see the Mandalorian blacksmith. And Mando finally gets his signet. It's a stylized mud horn. It looks really good. I love the scene with the blacksmith and how she's just sort of matter of fact telling him, listen, this is your mission to secure this child, to return this child to their family. I mean, it's it's your honorable mission. And it's it's great because it's not just sort of an edict or or a bounty. This is a higher calling of an honorable man. And I think this is going to be the driving force behind Mando that's going to push him through unknown peril, uh, Future challenges. The jetpack versus TIE fighter scene is amazing. Uh, the Rising Phoenix is not a jetpack. It's actually called the Rising Phoenix. That fight scene between the TIE... I mean, it was just... It was epic. It was awesome. Now, obviously, he doesn't quite know how to use the jetpack yet. So he's just used it sparingly. But the way he improvises with that and his grappling hook and the bombs, I just... I thought that played well. It didn't seem gimmicky, which it could have... It could have come off as just cartoony and silly. But it really didn't. I really liked it. Now, as the camera sort of pans back to the TIE fighter, I assume that the hatch would open and Moff Gideon would come out and, you know, maybe be a little bit bloody and obviously, uh, you know, pissed off. And, you know, I, I got to get that Mando. But when we see the blade pierce the hull of the ship and do a circle, I'm like, wait, is that is that what I think that is? And dude comes out with the Darksaber. That was amazing. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Darksaber was wielded by the first Mandalorian to become a Jedi a long time ago. Now, the Darksaber actually played a pretty big part in the Clone Wars. It was involved in... Many of the main storylines. It was first wielded by Pre Vizsla, who was the Mandalorian in charge of Death Watch. Uh, Maul had it at one point when he defeated Pre Vizsla. He actually used that to behead Pre Vizsla. And then he later on used that to kill Duchess Satine, right in front of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And we would see the Darksaber again in the Rebel series, where it started off with Maul and ended up with Sabine Wren. Okay, now let's start with the bad. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the episode. That whole scene with the speeder troopers, while it had some funny moments, it just went on way too long. And when you've got an episode that's less than an hour, every minute that goes by, you get a little anxious. I mean, I was like, come on, let's, let's speed this up. I've been really craving some story. And the fact that we had about two episodes of just filler, you know, in an eight-episode se uh, season, that's, that's too much. I also didn't understand why IG-11 took Baby Yoda into the city. I mean, if your protocol, if your programming is protection, why would you take the baby in the middle of a firefight? Now, right after Moth Gideon speeds, Mandalorian has a flashback, and it just went on way too long. And we've already seen some of this flashback before. I don't know why we had to start from the very beginning of the flashback and watch the entire flashback in its entirety. Everything we've seen up to this point always ended with the doors opening and a droid about to blast Mando. We could have just picked it up from there. And as cold calculating as Moth Gideon is, why did it give him till sundown? 
just seemed a little convenient. I really don't like the fact that the audience was able to see the Mandalorian without his helmet. I think it was still a little too early. I think that it could have been implied. We could have seen IG-11 begin to take it off and then the camera cuts away. Because what we saw was pretty much underwhelming. I mean, hey, it's Pedro Pascal. Well, yeah, I know that. His name is in the credits every week. I mean, this is Star Wars. I wanted to see like a robot eye or an arm going out of his forehead or something. And that's another thing. I think we found out too much about the Mandalorian in this episode. I mean, we found out what his name is. We know that he's not even a Mandalorian. He was a foundling. Uh, we know what his face looks like. Some of the things that I've liked so far is the fact that the Mandalorian is mysterious. We don't know everything. And I don't know that we should know everything about him. I think all that we really need to know is he appears to be an honorable man. And that's it. I think his past should remain clouded and shady and, and unfamiliar because that makes more of an interesting character. Okay, can we talk about baby fire starter? Okay, I mean, the fact that he can stop fire now... We're getting a little ridiculous. I was afraid of this. It seems like the Force with Baby Yoda is becoming like a convenient plot point, but it didn't even need to happen in this episode. They could have just shot the guy coming in with the flamethrower. I mean, they were fully armed. I don't know why Baby Yoda had to step in anyway. It seemed unnecessary, and I, I just don't like where this is going. I didn't like the fact that the magical hairspray was able to heal him. I think that it was a big deal to have his helmet removed, only to just spray some stuff on the side of his face. I mean... I expected a little bit more. It should have been, there should have been more payoff than that. Once again, maybe some big scar or some massive gash or something. Some reason why we had to take that helmet off. You know, it was so dire that it had to be taken care of. But you just sprayed some, you know, Febreze on him. I don't know. You just hit him with some Bactine and called it good. Okay, this next issue could be a big problem in the future. We have all these different directors directing different episodes. I think that this was actually a retcon of what happened in episode three. I mean, we see the big shootout with uh, Deborah Chow's first episode. And... There's some dialogue between Mando and the and you know the big Mandalorian where they say you're going to have to relocate the the, the the covert and he's like hey listen this is the way we we understand this, we're doing what we got to do you know we're we're a family you know it, it was worth it but then we come back and we find out that all the Mandalorians were killed and slaughtered well but I thought you were going to relocate the covert I mean did this happen instantly I mean you had a giant firefight where you just laid waste to everything there's no way that the Empire showed up that quick and just killed the Mandalorians before they could get off the planet. It just didn't make any sense to me. I mean, if anything, Mando should have been surprised that anyone was still in the covert. Maybe you go to the covert to sort of seek refuge and you find out that, oh, wait, the Mandalorians were actually killed and never made it off the planet. And then Mando was surprised and like, no, you know, I tried to, I tried to warn them, you know, that would have made a little more sense and uh, a dramatic moment. IG-11 sacrifice seemed forced to me. I mean, you know, we see Mando's predator vision again, which was cool. And he sees there's roughly eight to ten guys outside and then we're supposed to believe that the only way we can get through these this squad this whatever is by ig11 just blowing himself up y'all just took out three times as many people earlier in the episode and when ig11 stepped in the lava i thought we we're gonna have like a terminator 2 scene where he was just gonna start <laughs> melting we just see you know, hasta la vista baby <laughs> Now, the blacksmith made a point to say, listen, you're going to have to continue to train with the Rising Phoenix. It's not going to respond to your commands right away, but give it some time. But by the end of the episode, Mando just takes off with Baby Yoda. One of the last things that Grief Targa says is, uh, yeah, Navarro is a fine planet. Now that you've killed all the uh, the Empire, we're going we're gonna to stay here. <laughs> the lava planet that smells like sulfur? All right, now it's time to rate this episode. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I thought it was a great episode. It had some flaws, but I think the good far outweighed the bad. Now, if Disney could just make some Mandalorian merch available so I could support a show that I enjoy. I mean, where's my Mandalorian helmet? Where's my dark saber? I got a Razor Crest, but it's a Hot Wheels. It's, it's this big. I paid for my Mando Black Series figure two months ago. I won't get that thing till May. But at least I got my off-world Jawa figure. I mean, plenty of these available. But anyway, y'all, those are my thoughts. Let me know down in the comment section. Did you enjoy this episode? What do you think about the season so far? Are you excited about season two? Hit like if you like the video. Subscribe if you like the content. Y'all have a blessed day, and I will see you next time.